Now the fun part starts. So I'm going to add, turn it over now to Paul Brink and to provide his remarks and to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everyone. Please heed the cautionary statements. When we set out 15 years ago, relaunching Franco Nevada, we didn't know what the future would hold. Um, but there were some core principles. Uh, and the first was, our view was gold as a risk off investment. And we set out to create a company that would be the lowest risk possible gold investment company. The second was the appreciation that the greatest amount of value in the mining industry is generated at the drill bit and to create a business that provided shareholders exposure to that exploration optionality. The third piece was an understanding that we were investing in highly cyclical market uh, and that's best done with a conservative balance sheet to make sure that we'd have access to capital when others didn't. That has worked remarkably well. Here's a snapshot of how the business has grown over those 15 years. You can see whether it's the geos, the revenues, the EBITDA, it's grown in the order of, of six to seven times. The market cap in the bottom right-hand corner has kept track with the growth in the business. The share price appreciation that that represents is roughly a 17% CAGR over that 15-year period. In terms of dividends, our approach has reflected that philosophy. And the first is um, make sure that, that we could sustain the dividend regardless of the gold price environment uh, to provide that risk off investment that shareholders are looking for. And the second was I hope that the dividend would be, progr be progressive. With the growth in the business, we've been able to increase that dividend uh, 16 times consecutively. The Total dividends now 1.98 billion. Uh, our next dividend is due June this year, uh, and that will take us past the 2 billion mark of dividends paid. Our IPO investors in US dollars are realizing close to 9% in Canadian dollars, a 12% yield. Speaking a bit about our business model, and the two main aspects, uh, and the first <coughs> relates to growth. Uh, as we've mentioned, the greatest value in the industry is that exposure, exposure to exploration optionality. That has been a huge driver, growth driver in our business. The second is because our interests are non-operating interests, management's not spending its time on operating issues. We're able to spend all our time uh, thinking and executing on the growth of the business. The third, and again relates to non-operating interests, is we can grow a much more diversified portfolio than an operating company can because we don't have to operate each of those assets. The second aspect really relates to the instruments that we invest in, royalties and streams. Uh, they're both top line instruments. That means a couple of things. It's a free cash flow business. Uh, there are no capital calls that we have to answer to. We're not exposed to operating costs and, and for that reason, not exposed to cost inflation. And inflation is one of the main reasons that so many investors invest in gold. And lastly, it's a very high margin business. Both those interests are top line interests. Uh, so we have a very strong cash flow generating business. We recognize our role in the business is largely allocating capital on behalf of our shareholders. It means uh, in doing due diligence on our assets, we, we put a high priority on ESG, making sure that any of the assets that we invest in minimize the environmental impact, making sure that there is a net benefit to communities and also ourselves engaging and making contributions towards those communities. In terms of governance, uh, the first thing in governance for us is alignment with shareholders and what that means is ownership. Uh, we treasure our culture of ownership in the business. I'm proud that between the management and the board, we own more than $200 million of stock uh, it is very key to us to make sure that we act like owners and not like managers. And the last one I'll touch on is we really strive to have an inclusive workforce. Uh, we have set um, 
goals in terms of diversity, both at the board and at the senior management level. And again, this year have increased those goals. And uh, I am sure that we will be able to execute on them. Briefly on our asset portfolio, our business is unique in its scope, uh, both in terms of being a royalty and a streaming business, 421 assets in total. Uh, we've been able to benefit from the, the, the optionality, the expiration optionality that those royalty assets have brought, as well as the stable cash flows and the long life assets we've been able to invest in with our stream assets. We have the most diversified portfolio <clears throat> amongst our peers, uh, whether that is by asset, by operator, by jurisdiction, and with that diversification comes that low risk aspect of the business. Our core assets are all precious metal streams on some of the world's largest copper assets. Uh, for all of these investments, they've been outperforming since uh, expectations, since we made the investments, and they really do uh, represent that truism, which is that great assets get even better over time. But all assets do have their bumps in the road, and we have had some, uh, starting a couple of years with Candelaria, and earlier this year at Antipakai with social disruptions and, and Cobre, as First Quantum has renegotiated with the government. Uh, but going through those bumps in the road really has, for me, reiterated the strength of our business. Uh, and how robust it is uh, in that even when we've had our production disruptions and, and production halted for short periods, there's no loss in long-term value to our business. It's just a deferral of revenue. If that ore isn't mined one week, it's mined the next. Or if it's not one quarter, it's mined the next. Um, when I think about how robust our business is, I really feel that we are blessed. Turning to our growth outlook, Three main elements to our growth, and, and the first is the ramp up of Cobre Panama. It is our largest asset. For, first Quantum is in the process of ramping throughput up from 85 million tons per year up to 100 million tons per year. They announced just last week they've completed the physical aspects of that expansion. They're very confident in their ramp up and achieving that throughput by the end of the year. The second is a number of mine expansions. Uh, we have the Stillwater mine being expanded by uh, Sibania. We have the Tazius mine that's been expanded by Kinross, but perhaps most exciting is the expansion of the Detour mine. Uh, over the last couple of years, Kirkland Lake was tremendously successful expanding the resources there up from 20 million ounces up to 30 million ounces. Uh, now the asset in the hand of Ignico, they continue drilling, continue having success at depth on Detour, and now speaking about ramping up production from what used to be in the order of 650,000 ounces a year their target is now up towards a million ounces a year of production from Detour. The last of the categories is new mines. Uh, we have royalties on uh, 10 new mines that we expect to come into production over the next five years. Uh, we also have a, a stream that we acquired on Toca de Zinho, which is being built by G Mining Ventures in Brazil. Uh, they're making good progress on their mine, a tremendously experienced mine building team uh, and Toka de Zinho, due to come on near the back end of 2024, will really drive our next leg of growth. In terms of capital available, we currently have 2.2 billion. Uh, that is 1.2 billion a debt of, of cash. We have a credit facility for another billion dollars. Uh, the company has no debt, uh, so we're very well positioned to add incremental assets to the company. And to finish off, <coughs> Um, through our success in the industry, the success of our peers in the industry, it has attracted uh, new players into the industry. So there are a number of companies now that have royalty and stream assets. I don't think that holding those assets alone is what makes you successful in the industry. I think it's your approach to the business. And I think Franco is unique in that respect. Uh, the first is what I've spoken about, is that concept of ownership. Uh, having management and the board incented to make sure that every deal that we do, we're adding value, that we're driving the share price higher. We're not incented just to make the company bigger. The second is how we manage the balance sheet and putting a premium over financial flexibility as opposed to financial leverage. 
uh, and that really has given us the ability to have capital available when others haven't. It's been a huge driver in our success. And the third that I'll mention is asset selection. Uh, royalty and streams are a fantastic way to invest in the mining industry, but ultimately you're investing in mines. Your success depends on your asset selection. Do you invest in the right assets? Our focus has always been make sure we do good technical work on our assets, manage the downside. The upside will look after itself, and at Franco Nevada, it has. With that, I would love to take any questions, uh, and uh, we will take them both from the floor and from the webcast. But uh, first of all, are there any questions from the floor? I see a gentleman in the back. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Paul Dernan from Burlington. Um, it's almost unanimous. European, Asian, and North American car manufacturers, it's full speed ahead on electric vehicles. Yes, um, that's very true. Lithium, nickel, cobalt, but even more copper. And uh, Chrysler Stellantis, Windsor is committed. St. Thomas is committed to Volkswagen. Volvo's committed to Quebec. And uh, um, I'm not, okay, the exploring copper mines and the under construction copper mines aren't gonna give us a whole lot of copper in a hurry. If we go up from 5% to 25% of all cars electric over the next handful of years, we need a whole lot of copper in a hurry. And Chile is the largest copper exporter of the world. And I see your commitment to Panama for Spawnum, and I'm sure you have other commitments to copper. Um, I have to almost think, uh, how could there be anything else but a shortage of copper going ahead? There's only so many major copper mines operational in the whole world. And uh, is, is it time for this management to uh, be a whole lot more serious about copper and uh, because prices will be higher and there will be a shortfall. Uh, Cami Ingersoll is, as of last year, ha is making electric delivery trucks. Hey, well, uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, well, well, thank you. I, I appreciate the question and it is very topical. Uh, you know, as the world electrifies, there's no doubt we will need more copper. Uh, I think with that outlook, Franco Nevada will do fanta fantastically well. Uh, two main reasons. Uh, the first is those big gold streams that we have, precious metal streams, are all on big copper mines. Uh, as you say, it takes a long time to bring new mines into production, so the first thing that people will do is expand those existing mines. I've already spoken about First Quantum expanding Cobre Panama, um, but with higher copper prices, ex I expect that you will see more of the ore being mined out of Antamina, out of Candelaria, and out of Antipakai. So I think we will benefit very much from that trend. The next thing you, you, you would do is to say, what are the next generation of copper mines um, that should get built? And we're very fortunate we're exposed to many of those. Um, so that includes Cascabel, which is a very attractive block cave development target in Ecuador. Uh, we're exposed to Nueva Union, which is a joint venture between Tech and Dumont down in Chile. Um, we are exposed to Fiscachitas, another asset down in Chile. Uh, we have a royalty on, on what is now called Copper World in, in Arizona that Hut Bay is looking to get permitted. Um, so I think we will do very well with that trend and that exposure is it's not just to copper. Amongst the other battery metals, nickel, uh, is one that will also uh, see I increased interest. And again, we're exposed to Mount Keith's operations, a BHP uh, in Australia, and then there are a couple of interesting development projects. The Ring of Fire, the first asset that will get built there is the Eagle Mine. It's a nickel mine. We're exposed to that, as well as to the Crawford Nickel Deposit, which is a very large nickel deposit in Ontario. Uh, so thank you. A very good question, and, and uh, I think you highlight some of the upside at Franco Nevada. Thank you, Paul. Um, what do you think the impacts are from these interest rate hikes to uh, Franco Nevada? Uh, I'm going to hand that question to Ian Gray, who heads up our business development. 
thank you, and I think that's an excellent question. Uh, certainly, uh, it has caused a number of ripple effects through the mining industry. Uh, one thing I would point to is the dislocation uh, that interest rate hikes have had in the bond market. I think that's quite for us. Uh, with other providers of capital like the bond market uh, not being there, it gives us an opportunity to fill that void. Additionally, I think our cost of capital uh, is increasingly competitive in this environment and it's quite favorable for uh, new business going forward. Thank you, Ian. Yes, I see another question. Hi, the company has uh, accumulated a rather significant cash position. What's the potential for a special dividend? I'm going to hand that question to Sandra Branner, our CFO. Sandy? Thanks, Paul. Um, that's right. As Paul mentioned, we've got uh, $1.2 billion in cash on the balance sheet. Our priority is and always will be to continue to add long life good assets to the portfolio. So that is the number one priority. Uh, but we're very proud of returning capital to shareholders as well. And as highlighted, we've raised our dividend for 16 years in a row. Um, so I think that's the policy you'll see going forward as steady increases each year. Um, so to say for a special dividend, uh, not at this time. Any further questions from the floor? I don't see any for now. Uh, Lloyd, any questions on the webcast? Uh, we have no questions from the webcast. All right. <clears throat> Let me return to the script. We have concluded the events. So with no further questions, <laughs> before we close the meeting, a reminder that we'll be releasing our Q1 res results later today, and a press release should cross the wire earlier this evening. We hope you're able to join us for our Q1 conference call, which is scheduled for 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Thank you all for your support of Frank Arvada and have a good afternoon.